Um, and today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the moduli space construction. And then my plan is to go back and show you how all this stuff works in the moduli of gauged maps that, that we were discussing, So I think, um, which I think is a fun example. Oh, I do say that uh, there's one thing I noticed yesterday that I, I, I omitted one hypothesis that we're going to need today. So on, our, on, a, on the numerical invariant, <clears throat> I mean, we're not going to need this, but because but, uh, I'm not going into that much detail in the proof. But um, so the, you know, the numerical invariant takes, assigns any, any uh, z, to the, z to the n graded object, which you can think of as a map like this. And it spits out some function. And in the particular case where this is just a single z graded object, you can think of this function as giving you a number, which is just evaluating at one. Um, and I did. I do need the, the following sort of hypothesis for the for the result. Uh, that if 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 you know if you look at this function, if mu g of x is greater than zero, that implies that mu g of x is less than zero. If mu g of x is equal to zero, that implies that uh, mu g of minus x is equal to zero. So I do need this, uh, uh, this sort of hypothesis on the function. But I just, for the posterity, because it's being recorded, I didn't want to, wanted to make sure I got all the, the hypotheses there. But it's not, it's not conceptually that important. This, is, this holds for the kinds of invariants that we studied. This, you know, the, fo the formula I wrote down, this is like a linear thing divided by the square root of a quadratic form. So this is sort of automatic, these hold. So in, the, in all the examples, this holds automatically. OK, so that's a little sort of left a parenthetical from yesterday. So OK, so let's talk about moduli spaces. So the, the quintessential example of this, uh, besides Arden's criteria, where you say, OK, here's a, here's a moduli functor, and then boom. Arden's criteria constructs for you a, a, an atlas. It constructs a, shows that it's an algebraic stack. So the, the next big thing, uh, development along these lines, I guess maybe, well, I don't want to make, but one, another big development along these lines was the Kiyomori theorem. So, for, so this is, I'm going to discuss a little bit the moduli spaces. So this is theorem Kiyomori, and that um, if if x is an algebraic stack, oh yes, oh yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Two two antipodal points should have opposite signs, and then if they're zero, they should both be zero. Yeah, that's thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, so if x is an algebraic stack. Um, and the and uh, and let's say let's say a finite type. This is not the strongest version of the statement, but a finite type over a, over a locally Noetherian scheme. Let me let me actually just let's say and finite type and separated. Uh, over a locally Noetherian scheme, S, that implies that there exists a coarse moduli space. Um, X to S. Uh, so, And so what do I mean by coarse moduli space? So this is an algebraic space X um, and a map like this that should be universal, uh, universal map to other algebraic. So any, any map from the stack to some algebraic space factors uniquely through X. And this should be bijective on, on geometric points. So, um, so that's the kind of, that's, that's the, this gives you this construction of a coarse moduli space. So let me see if I get all those. And also, in this, uh, under these hypotheses, um, x will also be x will again be separated in locally finite type. Over s. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's the Kilmore theorem. So this seems like sort of a slam dunk. So this is a, I, this is like a very uh, this is a very useful theorem for many applications, in particular like things like in, in, in enumerative geometry or something like that. It sort of in many many cases this obviated the need for GIT entirely because you know if you write down a moduli problem carefully, as long as there are no quote unquote strictly semi-stable points, so you say so the the procedure is like oh I want to I want to study the moduli of this sort of thing, or I want to integrate over you know, curves with this property or something like that. So you write down a moduli functor, you check that it's an algebraic stack, which is usually pretty easy, and then you observe that the, basically the automorphism groups of, of objects are finite. If I, if I, if I, that's, that's what this, so the separated condition, I, so I should say that in the case of schemes, every scheme we care about is, is usually is separated, right? So the separated is a very mild kind of condition for the geometry that we want to do with schemes. But for stacks, this implies the separatedness condition. Uh, you know, so, so I say so separated is, is just the same thing as saying that the diagonal is proper. And this, in particular, Im implies that uh, any point uh, is, is a proper. So for every so so the separated condition, <clears throat> for, we're very used to just ignoring it somehow, or I'm very used to just like you know uh, ignoring it for for schemes because every scheme I care about is separated. For stacks, it's a little different because the stack being separated actually implies that objects have only finite automorphism groups, and it's 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 not exactly that, but you know, um, but it's pretty close. So, in fact, there's a stronger version of the Kiyomori theorem that says basically if 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 automorphism groups of, of families are all finite, then, then you have this moduli space. So anyway, oh yeah. No, it's, a, it's an Arden stack. Uh, this is very close to being Deline Mumford, but the, no, but you don't need like an at all, like, like uh, I guess, um, what is like uh, mu, mu P, a B mu P in characteristic P, maybe that doesn't have an at all atlas or something. There are like these examples in characteristic P where, so the, it's, yeah, it's technical. This is very close to being a Deline Mumford stack, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The finite automorphism groups are very close to being Deline Mumford. The, technically, the definition of Deline Mumford means there's an atoll atlas. And so actually con just constructing a surjection, an atoll surjection might not be possible for some stacks in characteristic P that have finite automorphism groups, but anyway. What? It's a spa algebraic space. Yeah. So I should say that nothing I'm going to say today. I'm going to. Pr I'm presenting this as if it's a complete story, but I, none of this methods that I have at the moment are. I don't have any general methods at the moment for estab establishing projectivity of moduli spaces. So, so this is this will always produce for you an algebraic space, and then you need some other argument for. So, in the case of in this setting, um, like uh, Kolar has a method for for if you have a line, if you happen to have a line bundle, there's a sort of method for showing that it's uh, that it's ample on that it descends. But um, yeah. Yes, it could be. Yeah. Then uh, that would be very different. It would be very far from the Mumford. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 This could be an abelian variety. Oh no no no. But the sorry. The, but the sorry. Uh, so maybe I just, the, this should be this should the inertia should be finite here. Stack of finite type over a separated looking through scheme and the, and with finite inertia. Thank you. Yeah, oh, that's what you're picking up on. Yeah, right. So basically, the, yeah, this this theorem applies for stacks which have which, which objects have finite automorphism. So the typical way that you use this is you write down a moduli problem that you care about. You check that it's sort of objects have finite automorphisms. Then you quote this theorem, and then you like move on with your life, and then you prove things about intersection theory or whatever that moduli space. So I guess the point is that what I'm saying here is that actually in geometry, if you consider like a stack, if you consider a uh, a you know quasi projective scheme if you consider the quotient stack of a quasi projective scheme modulo um, uh, modulo a linear algebraic group Um, so this is, yeah, 
everything has a written on the board here is correct. So, so separated means that you have that your auto implies that your automorphism groups are proper. Um, so if you're particular, if you're quasi-projective scheme model linear algebraic group, then you know that all automorphisms, which are just stabilizers, all stabilizer groups are affine. So then separated implies, so then you then you know your automorphism groups are affine and proper, so they're finite. Oops, I did a bad thing again, sorry. I've been told that I'm writing too big, but I know, I know, but I, I have to cut it more, okay. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, anything that you're sort of going to access using GIT, anything in the world that like where things look kind of like a quotient of a quasi-projective thing by a linear algebraic group, uh, then, then this sep separating this hypothesis is very strong because it's saying that basically you can only have finite automorphisms. So things like you know vector bundles when the rank and degree are not co-prime, vector bundles over a curve, things those things have automorphisms, and so this is not this theorem doesn't help you there, right? Okay, so the the correct notion there, which is actually you know which is inspired by a notion uh, introduced by Sisadri the, uh, the, of, of having a good quotient. So the correct replacement for this idea of a coarse moduli space is uh, what's called a good moduli space. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Not this, separatedness alone does. Separatedness implies that the automorphism groups are proper, but then also if you have affine diagonal, which is the case for many of the moduli problems that we study that, are, that arise, and then, then you'll have finite automorphism. So this theorem is, is, can't apply to the kind of you know, things like vector bundles where the rank and degree are not co-prime. Okay? So, so, the, okay, so the, the, the sort of correction for this, the definition of a good moduli space, it, it, it's kind of amazing. It's very, this is, this is definition due to Alper. Alper's thesis is a good moduli space. Let me just do this now. So for an algebraic stack, uh, X is a map to an algebraic space. such that, and then there are only two hypotheses. One is that the push forward from uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on the stack to quasi-coherent sheaves on X is exact. And two is that uh, the push forward of O is O. So the canonical map like that, and it's an isomorphism. So, right, and so this is, in the, you know, when X is a quotient stack, this is exactly the definition of a good quotient, if, that, if you're familiar with that. Um, but this is, this is, I mean, the cool thing about this, the definition is that it, has, it implies many of the nice properties. So the, the typical example of this, yeah. the, the typical example is if you take, if I take spec of A, an affine thing, modulo uh, and, uh, G, where this is reductive. So I take the quotient stack spec of A mod G, and I map to spec of the ring of invariance, right? So in other words, GIT quotient is, is, the, is the sort of quintessential example of that thing, and it was, of this thing. Um, but this implies, the, 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 the definition alone implies many of the nice properties of this map. So the, basically many of the nice properties of a GIT quotient. So the definition implies, and in, in Jared's thesis, he, he has uh, you know, a long list of things, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. Um, yeah, so each, every fiber, Q inverse of P, has a unique closed point. I.e. polystable. Also, this uh, so th this 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 uh, notion is is stable under base change, um, but so this is like a familiar from the from vector bundles over curve that that every the moduli space that you get is literally parameterizing um, you know polystable objects is bijective with polystable objects. 
So here you just say it's bijective with closed points in the fiber. Um, and in fact, this isn't in Jared's thing because it required later development, but in fact, you can say exactly what the fiber is. The fiber consists of points which are S equivalent um, in, in, the sense that, in the sense that the fiber consists exactly of any two points in X, such that there's a filtration of one and a filtration of the other whose associated graded is, 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 is the same, basically. So, with I, so, so, so I, I, you won't find this in Jared's thesis, but you'll find it sort of in subsequent things. Uh, um, and I'll, so I'll just say it consists of S equivalence classes. Where you define S equivalence is the natural definition, natural uh, generalization using the philosophy that a filtration is a map from A1 mod GM. Um, okay, so also I guess this is this is a surjective, so this map is uh, Q is surjective. And universally closed, and so, in, and in particular, this implies that X has the so this this implies that X has the quotient topology. So this is a sort of quotient in that sense. It's also a quotient in the sense that it's universal. For maps to spaces, um, yeah, and also I'm not. Uh, all, the, another nice thing is that you can say you can say like vector bundles. A vector bundle on X is exactly a vector bundle on the stack on the stack, such that all the isotropy groups act trivially. So there's a way to describe, sort of, to understand a little bit more about the geometry of this thing. You can understand what quasi coherent sheaves are here. It's the it's the things where the where the isotropy acts, or at least, I, well, I guess, vector bundles, I think coherent sheaves have the same characterization. Probably quasi-coherent as well, but anyway. Um, okay, so, so that's the good moduli space definition. Um, so in other words, this is the kind of thing that any time you have a GIT quotient, in, oh, I should also say something about this. Uh, this is like a good, this is, this is an example in characteristic zero. So you need that this exactness, uh, the exactness part of this is sort of uh, is a better notion in characteristic zero. So Jared subsequently had a notion called an adequate moduli space, which is uh, like works, which is sort of like GIT in characteristic P. So, but but the but the moment we I have less to say about adequate moduli spaces, so I'm going to stick to good moduli space. So either your characteristic zero, or really I guess I guess you can erase this, and say and say that G is linearly reductive. And then it's okay. And then it's okay in any characteristic, but there are just, of course, very few linearly reductive groups in characteristic P. I mean, relatively few. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so, so things like anything you're going to construct from a GIT quotient in characteristic zero, the thing you actually end up with is a good moduli space for the semi-stable locus. So I guess what I'll say, so, so um, I can tell you the, uh, um, so, so that was where things were for, for a little while. Oh, let me, I have a little more space here. But so uh, recently, a few years ago, so there's a theorem due to uh, uh, Alper, Hall, and Rude uh, that, um, uh, that sort of any good moduli space so that in this setting uh, there exists a, a tall cover uh, of the following form. So, of x such that, and you have a diagram like this. So you have spec of A mod G, a quotient. This is spec of AG. Um, here's x, and then x. So this is your quotient map. So uh, in other words, and this, this, this diagram is, is Cartesian. So 
basically, this is a, this is a consequence of their, the main theorem in their paper from 2015 or so that, uh, that you know, um, uh, that if you have a good moduli space, so this is, the, this is the sort of quintessential example, and this is the kind of stuff that comes in GIT. This is saying, this, is, this theorem sort of implies that if you have a good moduli space, then like a tall locally, it is a GIT quotient, the tall locally over the space. So this was a very interesting thing because it somehow says that this notion of a good moduli space is not that far away from GIT. This tells you that there's basically one way to construct a good moduli space. So this is this, that every good moduli space, you'll be able to find some sort of a tall cover. Of, so this is, a, this is a now a, a tall cover of your stack. So for any anytime you have a good moduli space, you should be able to find in a tall cover of the stack. And then the good moduli space of, of the stack will somehow be like, you know, you, you take the tall cover, you take the fiber product, and you should just glue together copies of spec of, a mod, spec of, spec of the ring inv of invariance of some tall cover of your stack. So this is sort of saying that, the, the, that, that this is, and that's essentially what GIT is, right? GIT just gives you a way, I have some quotient stack, and I want to cover it, the semi-stable locus, I can cover it by things that look like spec of A mod G, where G is linearly reductive, and then I just have to check that when I take ring of invariance, I can still get, you know, still get something that I can glue together into a moduli space. And that, that G is linearly reductive. So G, the, well, uh, sorry, let me talk over X. So G reductive. Yeah, so um, uh, linearly reductive. Well, yeah. In this generality, probably you can just say that really G is GLN. But in the, the, there's a, basically what they, their theorem said, their actual theorem says that uh, any, in any stack, if you have a, a point with a, a, with a reductive, linearly reductive uh, automorphism group, then you can find in a tall neighborhood of that point. That's of the form spec of A mod G. So that's what their theorem says. And so the, that, the, that one consequence of this good moduli space thing that you can show is that every closed point in a good mod, if the stack has a good moduli space, then every closed point has to have a linearly reductive automorphism group. So you just go to, you look at the clo all the closed points and you find little tall neighborhoods around all of them. And then you, just, you, you don't need to do all of them. You can just do a bunch of them. Um, okay, so anyway, but this is a very, this is an interesting philosophically because it sort of guides your, it guides your, your eye on how to construct good moduli spaces. Right? It says that basically what you have to be looking for is an Atal cover, um, and, then, and then just try to imitate the construction of GIT. So the, the sort of, the kind of result, the ultimate result along these lines is the following. So this is due to myself, um, and uh, let me get the, an Alper and Heinloth. So let's say if X, um, X is, is finite type, um, finite type, and this is uh, important. So X is a finite type algebraic stack, um, and with affine diagonal, so the theorem is that you have a stack like this. X has a separated good moduli space if and only if, and then there are two conditions, which I'll explain subsequently. So if and only if, First is that X is, is theta reductive. So these are, these are you know, knots. And two is, is what's called X is S complete. So, um, and then it's, and for, sub, furthermore, it's the, the moduli space that you get is proper over S if and only if X satisfies the value of criterion for properness, or the existence part of the value of criterion. So X, yeah, X won't, won't satisfy the uniqueness part unless it's separated, but it should satisfy the existence part, and that implies that the space is proper. Okay, so this is the theorem. So in order for this to, in order for this to sink in, I have to explain to you what these conditions mean. <clears throat> so the, 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 the nice thing about this theorem is that, is that there's sort of both conditions are, both theta reductivity and, and S completeness are in a sense valued of criteria. Um, they sort of, they involve checking things about families over, over relatively small schemes, in fact, over, over surfaces. So let me just tell you what is theta reductive. So theta reductive means, and I'll just give it to you as a, a lifting criterion. So, so if I take, let's say I have a family, um, so if I take A1, so, 
So let's say r is a DVR. So I take a discrete valuation ring. I take a1 times spec of r. And so this is, this is a little uh, two-dimensional scheme, right? And it has a, and, and it has a unique, the, so there's a GM action on it. And there's a unique closed uh, uh, GM invariant point, so that's the origin. So I'm going to remove 0 comma 0. So in other words, that's the special point in spec of r and the, and the 0 in a1. And then I'm in quotient by GM. So any map like this to the stack x, I, I mean, the, it's the, this, is the, this is the unique closed point in the stack a1 r mod gm. It's the 0 in a1 times the special point in, in, in spec of r. Yeah. Um, so so, so this, is a, this is like a punctured surface, right? There's a little, a little surface, and, you, and you, I remove a point. It has a gm action just acting by scaling in a1. And then let's say I have a family over this thing. I'll tell you more concretely. With, so then this thing sits inside. Uh, uh, a one R mod GM, just the full surface, and the 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 statement is that there should exist a unique filling here. A, so in words, you have this little surface, little little punctured surface with a GM action. If you have a GM equivariant family over the punctured surface, you should be able to extend it uniquely over the puncture. But there's another way to interpret. Um, there's another way to interpret what this is saying, which is that. So what is the stack A one R? So so that's that. This is the definition. Um, but what is a, A1R minus 0, 0 mod GM? So if I quotient, if I take A1, um, uh, so yeah, so basically A1R is really, it's like a sort of, it's like a, it's a, it's a surface, and then there's two, so let's say, let's say uh, um, coordinates, let me use coordinates pi uh, is a uniformizer. For R, um, uh, and T is the coordinate on A1. Okay, so that's so. So basically, there there are two lines in this in this thing that are that are GM invariant. There's the there's the line where where the pi is equal to zero, and then there's, there's a line where T equals zero. And if I remove the line T equals zero, and I quote, then if I remove the line T equals zero, then GM acts freely. So if I remove the line t equals zero and then quotient by gm, this is just a copy of spec r. If I remove the line, if I remove the line uh, pi equals zero, then this is just a copy of a1 over the generic point. So it's a1 over the fraction field k, and so then it's so that then and then gm acts in this usual way. So in fact, this little so I guess what I'm trying to say is that this little stack, so a1r minus zero comma zero mod gm. This is really a copy of what I'm calling theta k. It's a1 k modulo gm k union, a copy of spec of r, and it's union over this generic point spec of k. So in other words, what is a map from this to your stack? It is a, an r point of the stack and a, and a, and a filtration over the, over, the, over the fraction field and an isomorphism over the generic point. In other words, it's an R point of your stack and a filtration of the generic fiber. So what is this? This is, this is really, this map here is really just saying it's an R point plus a filtration of generic fiber. So what is this condition really saying? It says that if you have an R point and a filtration over the generic fiber, you can extend, uh, this thing is just a filtration of your R point. So it says, that this criterion says in words, if you have an R point and a filtration of the generic fiber, you can always extend that filtration over the whole family. Notably, this is not true for vector bundles, uh, yeah, so uh, this is not true for vector bundles over a curve, but in fact it's true for semi-stable vector bundles over a curve, which we'll see. And it's true for coherent sheaves, though. You can always extend, a, if you have a filtration of a, of a vector bundle, if you have a family of vector bundles, a filtration of the vector bundle of the generic fiber, you can always extend it as a filtration of coherent sheaves, but the special fiber might not be a filtration by vector bundles anymore. Okay, so this is, this is theta reductivity. We'll, we'll talk more about this in a second. The other thing is S-completeness, and this is actually named after Sousadri. And, it's, and the, I guess the point is that, um, the point is that it's very similar. This condition is very similar. It says that if you have, uh, 
So <clears throat> I'm going to have to introduce this scheme. This was introduced by Johan, by Heinloth, in a, uh, in, a, in a previous paper studying the separatedness of the moduli of G bundles. Um, uh, uh, so spec of, so I'm going to define for you a little stack. <clears throat> uh, we, call it, we call that STR bar. So this is, stands for Shashadri test scheme uh, uh, with respect to R. So this is, this is a spec of R adjoins T, T comma S modulo st minus pi, using the same notation, so pi is a uniformizer of R, um, uh, modulo gm, where the gm action here is encoded by giving t weight minus 1 and 1. So I give t weight minus 1 and s weight 1, and then, and then that defines a sort of, and this, is a, this has weight 0, so that defines a GM action on this quotient thing. So what is this thing really? This is the, the what is this stack? This is like the versal deformation of the node. So over, <clears throat> if this thing lives over R, and the, at the, uh, <clears throat> at the, um, at the generic fiber, so if I, if I, again, this thing has this sort of same picture, except that instead, in this picture, the R action was just, was just scaling, and was just going like this. Uh, the, the GM action was just scaling in the T direction, scaling T down to zero. This is a similar picture, except I, I should draw it diagonally. So here's like T equals zero, here's S equals zero, and now I guess the GM action is going like this. It's like sort of hyperbolic. So uh, is that, I don't know if, that, if that's clear. So, this, so this, is happen, this is happening over spec R. The generic fiber, if I, take the, if I go away from this, this, this S equals 0, T equals 0 is all happening in the, in the, over the special point of spec R. Away from that, away from this generic fiber, away from the special fiber, the GM is acting freely. And then the special fiber is basically two copies of A1 glued together with the GM acting in opposite, with opposite weights. <clears throat> so in particular, let me just, so there was a, in particular, if I remove s equals 0, if I remove s equals 0, if I sort of invert s here, then in fact, gm is going to act freely. Because if I invert s, that's, that's, then, then, then t just goes away. This, this lets you just cancel t. And yet I just get r adjoint s plus or minus 1, you know, mod this <coughs> gm action. So, so if, I remove, if, I say, if, I, if I remove the line t equals 0 or the line s equals 0, gm acts freely. <coughs> and so what this thing really looks like, so. so Is what? I don't know. I just made that picture up right now. Does that, if it's not clear, you can just ignore it. I mean, the, the more traditional algebra geometric way to draw this is like you have a node here, and uh, and here's your special point over spec R, uh, and then and then and then generically the generic point acts freely. This is just a copy of GM over the generic point, and then and then two copies of A1 meeting at the point. That's the more traditional thing. Okay, so STR has again this point, and if I remove zero zero. Then this is actually just equal to. So I, I, if I remove the x-axis, I get a copy of spec of R. If I remove the y, if I, if I remove the, the if I remove the s-axis, I get a copy of spec of R. If I remove the t-axis, I get a copy of spec of R. So this thing is like is like two copies of spec of R, but they're glued together at the generic point. So that's one way to think about this. So another way to think about this is this kind of ravioli picture. This is the spec of R. Yet another way to think about what's going on is this. This is the, so two copies of spec of R glued together at the generic point. That's a sort of a spec of R with a doubled origin. So it sort of looks like that. So it has this doubled origin. But then in the middle here, it's not missing a point anymore. Now you put two copies of A1. You know, uh, two copies of so now now these special points of the thing aren't really the special points in the stack anymore. They're both the generic points of an A1 mod GM. And the two different A1 mod GMs are meeting at the origin. So that's another way to think about it. OK, so the definition, so S completeness, um, is S complete if, for any diagram of the following kind, so if I have str bar minus 0, 0, 
mapping to x, this sits inside str bar, and there should exist a unique filling like this. So it's convenient that these algebra geometrically, this is a very similar to theta reductive, right? Because you have some, you have this is some, this is some surface, this is some regular, this is some regular two-dimensional scheme here, and you have a you have a single sort of punctured, you have a closed single closed point, which is s equals t equals zero. And it's saying if you have a family, if you have a GM equivariant family over this regular surface, uh, away from the R, uh, on this punctured regular surface, you can extend uniquely over the puncture equivariantly. That's all it's saying. So, they're, so algebra geometrically, they're too, too very closely related, which is convenient because often a proof of one will give you a proof of the other. So usually they'll have the same proof. Uh, although, although interpretation is quite different. So this is saying, this is something saying about, uh, this is some, saying something about extension of filtrations over a family. And what is this is saying something about separatedness, right? So this is saying that if you have a map from, if I remove, if I have a map from, a map from this thing is just two copies of spec of R, that agree, uh, two, two, two families over spec of R with an isomorphism over the generic fiber. That's literally what a map from this is. And this is saying that, well, if the stack were separated, those would be the same family. That isomorphism would extend over the whole family. But that's too, we've, we've, we don't want to do that because we're trying to, we're trying to uh, uh, understand some of this non-separated phenomena. So what this is instead saying, okay, you can't, you can't, you have two families over spec of R, and an isomorphism of the generic fiber, you can't actually extend that to an isomorphism of families, but you can, sort of, you can sort of fill it in in this way. You can extend it to something a little weaker, and namely, over the special fiber, those two things are gonna be S equivalent. Because in the special fiber, so you, you can't, they're not isomorphic, but the special fibers differ by taking a filtration of one, passing through the associated gradient, and that's the same as the associated gradient of filtration of the other. So this is sort of algebra geometric way, this filling condition of saying that if you have two families that are isomorphic of the generic fiber, then, their special fi then the special fibers are S-equivalent. And so that's the theorem. The theorem is that you only have to check those two things. And that implies a separated good moduli space. Okay, so that's the sort of end. Is that, let's see. Is that, oh yeah, so I could tell you a little bit about how this theorem is proved, but I think Okay, I think I have time to do that. So, so, so basically the way this is proved is it uses the slice theorem that I mentioned. So, so basically, so let me say the proof idea. Yeah? Yeah, and the filtrations are the special fiber. It's not exactly the same as saying that, but it, it implies that. It says that if you have, if you have two copies of respect of R, you can fill this, that, that gives you a map like this. Two families over spec R and an isomorphism of the generic fibers gives you a map like this. That's exactly what a map like this is. And then, uh, and then it says you can fill it to this, but then once you have this filling, you can see that over the special fiber, I get two copies of A1 mod GM that, that agree at the, that meet at the origin. So in other words, it's saying that the two special points now, the two special fibers, I can find two filtrations that so they're associated greater as isomorphic. But it's actually a little stronger because it's saying not only you know, not only are there two filtrations whose associated graded are isomorphic, but the, the filtrations are weighted and the associated graded is sort of isomorphic with the opposite order. Because that's what this, this, this is, the, you know, it's, it's not just the same, it's not the same, uh, it's not just the same point, it's the same graded point, but with an opposite where you flip the GM action. Um, yeah, so it turns out that like semi-stable bundles have this property, but that's not actually obvious from the, you know, from the proofs or whatever. It's not, it's, it's sort of not, it was a little bit surprising that actually, you know, if you have two, it's true that if you have two semi-stable bundles uh, uh, that map to the same point in the moduli space that you can find, you can take Jordan Holder filtrations, but this is saying something a little bit stronger, which is that you can literally take, find a filtration of one and a filtration of the other, which is not necessarily the Jordan Holder, and it's sort of, but it's uniquely determined. There's a unique canonical way to take a filtration of one and a filtration of the other, so it's the associated graders are isomorphic with the opposite grading. Okay, so the proof idea is basically, you know, uh, I, I, I can't, yeah, so the proof idea is that you, you want to construct, so the proof idea is that first of all, S completeness implies that closed points have, have reductive stabilizers. This is, and this is really the point where we need uh, characteristic zero because the slice theorem says that if you have a re linearly reductive, if you have a closed point with a linearly reductive stabilizer, 
then you can define in a tall map like this, where G is reductive, G is linearly reductive. Okay, and then, okay, so what do you want to do? There's really only one thing to do. This is like the cover. I should take the double intersections. So I should take, you know, spec of, I should take the, this, this sort of double intersections, uh, which is just the fiber product, uh, which is just the fiber product of this of the map. And I get something like a groupoid and a tall groupoid where, thing, where, where both of these things have the form like this. And now the, the only thing you can do is I sort of want to say that, uh, so I want to say that the thing I get down here is again in a tall groupoid. Um, wait, 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 hold on a second. Let me just try. What? B is the fiber product. This is the, this is the, so it, uh, this is, I'm saying this is the fiber product. This spec of A mod G times over X with spec of A mod G. Um, and I'm moving a little quickly, but basically that'll have to also be affine. Because that was because X has affine diagonal. It'll have to be affine, and actually th these maps are representable, so it's actually just still a quotient of another affine thing mod, mod G. <clears throat> so basically, you know that this has a moduli space, and you know how th this has a moduli space, and now you just want to say that, that this thing gives you the, exactly the data you need to be able to glue and put a moduli space in there. And, these, and, and it turns out to do that, you just need to know that, like, you, ne you need to know that this map, you need to know two things about this, it turns out. Uh, you need to know that uh, this is a tall, I guess you, that's all. And I need to know that it, it preserves automorphism groups, it's inertia preserving, um, and uh, it takes closed points to closed points. So, and that's of course, you would expect that, right? Because we secretly, we want this to be the base change of, of from, you, we secretly suspect there's a good moduli space and this should just be the base change of this picture. Um, so we'd expect that this map then, any, any diagram of this kind has the property that this map takes closed points to closed points and is inertia preserving. Uh, but it turns out that that's all you need to, to get this, arg this gluing argument to work. <clears throat> so the reason I mentioned the, the argument is that, is to say that this is not, this is not, this is a set, what is GIT really? Like GIT is a book that you can not read the whole thing and you can like find the theorem. And basically the book does this, right? The book is a theorem and the proof does this. It finds a bunch of affine open things, mod G, and then, and then now that because it's in the book, you don't have to do that every time you're reading, every time you're kind of trying to construct a moduli space. It has a theorem with hypotheses that you can check. And, then, and so that's basically what this, what this paper does too. It's like, you can do this, but in the world of algebraic stacks and where you're using a tall, you're doing a tall gluings instead of Zariski gluings. No, no, affine, the affine, sorry, affine, affine diagonal, so affine inertia, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the thing that gives you like, you know, semi-stable bundles where rank and degree are not co-prime. Yeah, that's the whole point here, is that you're allowed to have S equivalence, yeah. And the good moduli space isn't gonna be a coarse moduli space anymore. It's not parameterizing, it's not bijective with objects, it's only bijective with polystable objects or bijective up to S equivalence. It's an algebraic space, yeah. So again, the caveat is that I don't really have, at the moment, I don't really have a good, like sort of general picture about how to get projectivity. Even you have, you, you can have a line, this stability condition can be given by a line bundle. You can find the line bundle and you can show that it descends pretty easily, but then to show that it's ample. I, I don't really. Is it easy to see the other direction where the X has the good moduli space on X by by using properties? Um, yes, because those properties are both local over, those, those properties are both stable under base change along a map to a space. Because basically like any map from, the, any map from str bar to, a, to an algebraic space and any map from uh, theta r to an algebraic space has to sort of collapse onto r, spec of, has to just collapse to a map from spec of r. So, the, so in other words, so basically these conditions are local over an algebraic space and then we know that locally over any good moduli space, it looks like this. So you sort of, you just reduce these to, the, to, to verifying it there and then I wouldn't say, it's not, it's not like immediate but it's easy, it's not like difficult to see in the, in the spec of a mod g case. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the theorem, and that's a little bit of the, a taste of what the proof looks like. Uh, so now I wanted to, with the rest of the talk, I wanted to go back to our example, and I'd like to say, so I'd like to verify all of, the, both of these theorems, basically, to, to discuss how the hypotheses work in this case of MCG, in the case of gauge maps. So are there any more questions about this sort of general story picture before I sort of launch into that? Okay. Okay, so.
So how does this work? Um, so okay. So we have a couple things. Oh, and oh, I erased the theorem. But one another thing about this is that so that finite type thing basically it's saying that the that the stack you started with should be should be bounded. It should be quasi compact stack to get this moduli space. There's a version that doesn't assume that, but then you have to assume something like that. Like every, you basically need the fact that every point degenerates to a closed point. And that's a thing that can go really wrong. Like if you think about vector bundles over a curve, that stack has no closed points, basically, if you're in, in rank higher than two, because you can always continue, you know, you can always continue to degenerate. I mean, uh, so, so uh, in fact, like if you take, if I take objects, if I take some abelian category, like coherent sheaves on a curve, you can show that the moduli of objects in the abelian category is always Theta reductive and S complete, but it's not. So, so it'll have a good moduli space only, you know, if the if the if the if the stack of objects is bounded. But then, but the point is that it's not bounded. So that's why you need a stability condition. So if you consider all coherent sheaves on a curve, that actually satisfies the the main hypotheses of this theorem. But the but the 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 stack itself with no stability condition is is unbounded. So basically, yeah. So, um, okay. This does not satisfy those hypotheses, though. This this stack. So let's let's uh, um, okay. So so there basically are uh, there are basically a couple things we have to verify. We have to verify that Hardin or Simhan boundedness. Yes. Yes, I can. This is uh, so uh, M C G of X. So X X is a G projective scheme. C is a smooth curve, and this parameterizes things like this. So this is a G bundle. Um, P over X over C uh, plus a picture like this, so it's a it's a nodal map like this. U uh, to to um, uh, P of X. This, this is the associated fiber bundle, um, and then this map here. U is this is this is a stable. This is Kinsevich stable. And then this map here should be basically just introducing bubbles, uh, introducing trees of P1. So this is, this is degree one and, um, uh, and same genus. So this is a nodal curve that, that, it, that allows them. So in other words, it's a, it's a G bundle over the curve, and then it's a section of the associated bundle, but only after allowing some bubbles to develop. And the bubbles are required for this to be the, the, important, the, the important piece of the stack is that this thing you can forget because part of the data is a G bundle, you can forget to bun G of C. I can forget the data of this quasi section, and this map is proper or representable by, by proper Dillian Mumford stacks. Okay, so, so there's two conditions that we want to. So we, we wrote down this numerical invariant, right? We said mu of, uh, so, so if I give you a filter. Oh yeah, so, so to recall, so filtrations, I'm going to stick to G equals GLN. So filtration in this stack, because this map is proper, a filtration is just a filtration of the underlying bundle. That's just a filtration, a Z-weighted filtration. So I have EW plus 1 inside EW, inside EW minus 1. That's what a filtration is. It's a filtered vector bundle of the underlying of the underlying vector bundle. Oh, and that, that's or that's equal to the data of a finite filtration. P e zero, along with the choice of weights w zero less than da 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 less than w p. This is in z. So that's the data of a filtration. So, and, and this is for what I'm about to say. This is probably the more convenient way to think about it. And so the question is, can you find a thing which minimizes it? So you want to maximize a function mu. So if, you, if I fix this uh, uh, mu of a filtration f, if a filtration of this form, this is like the sum. So if, if this is f, if this data here is f, then mu of f was like a, uh, um, was some function. It was Lx plus L bun G divided by 
the square uh, plus delta uh, 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 delta LX plus bun LG divided by the square root of some number B. And this was a this was a linear form in these weights W naught through WP. This is a linear form, uh, uh, and then this is a, a quadratic form, positive definite quadratic form in these weights. So that's the so that's the sort of, that's the goal. And so the idea is that. Um, So let me just say that so the L, Lx, and L bun G are linear in W naught WP, and B is quadratic. That's basically the essential features that 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 need here. So basically, the way this works is that I take this function. So this, for any filtration, this is a function. But actually, we said that this function is actually defined for z to the n graded objects. So basically, for any, uh, so yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's an infinite, how do you find the boundedness? How do you check the boundedness here? So there's an infinite space. Um, that, I'm call, that I call the degeneration fan. So the stack M, so maximize this subject to the constraint that F of one is equal to some, is equal to some uh, you know, uh, fixed thing, which is, which is some filtration uh, E, and then some section, some quasi section U. So I fix the, 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 what it is over the, uh, what f of one is, and I'm asking, look at all filtrations. So there's a topological space which is associated to this stack and the, and the point, um, like that. And mu defines a continuous function, r. <clears throat> so, uh, so, what is this topological space? This, I, I, I call this thing the degeneration fan, but basically what it is is it's just a union. It's a general construction, but in this case, it's a union of cones. So one for each, so yeah. So one for each uh, filtration. So if I take a filtration, a filtered vector bundle with no weights, then sigma of that, you know, the cone is the following. It's the set of, it's the choices of, 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 of integers, or really rational numbers, or really real numbers. So I, 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 and I'll, I'll call this, so there's a little copy of R to P plus one, but I'll, I'll, I'll call this, I'll also label this by the filtration. So the idea is that if you, for, every, for any possible filtration of the underlying bundle, I can think of the data, remember, as a filtration and then a bunch of integers, but in the end, I'm only interested in these integers up to positive scaling anyway, so I might as well just sort of let them be rationals or I might as well let them be real numbers. So, so now I think there's a cone, there's this cone this, this, uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this vector space associated to every filtration, and then you can glue the cones. If I delete steps in the filtration, I, there are sort of canonical inclusions of the different cones that you get that way. Because right? if I delete one step here, then that's, you, you get sort of inclusions that way. The cone is this, is this, is this set of points. It's just, it's just the set. So this is real numbers. Ascending sequences of real numbers like this uh, living inside of that vector space. But it's really just the union of cones. And you know this extends to a continuous map, sort of by definition, because the topology here is just these, clone, the, these cones glued together. And in each of these cones, this I just said is a linear form divided by a positive definite quadratic form. So I guess I should say minus the cone point. It's, it's not defined at the origin. Mm 
no, this is a general construction. This degeneration fan is a, a general construction, but in this, in, this, in this case, this is what it amounts to. But I'm, gonna, I, I'm sort of I'm departing from the general story now just to focus on this example because I think it illustrates, but it's also more concrete. Okay. Okay, so, so uh, yeah. So the, the, the key observation here is that the, this is a cone, but the boundary of the cone is a union of, of cones for smaller filtrations. Um, I should say, so this, this, this part, that this MCG bar is joint work with uh, Paul, Pablo Solis and uh, Eduardo Gonzalez. So the point is that you have all these cones, you have these continuous functions, and then the, but then uh, the, the cones have the special property that the boundaries of these, the boundary of one cone is really just another cone for another filtration. Okay, so, so at this point, we say we're trying to maximize This function mu of 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 so this sort of abstract thing about a filtration is actually now just a, a function of the weights on on each of these cones. It's just a function of the weights given by a linear form divided by a quadratic form, um, and we're trying to maximize this function, and it depends on mu, mu delta, and this is equal to you know l uh, uh, l of w plus delta l x of w divided by uh, uh, b of, uh, square root of, oh shoot, did I, did I forget to do that again? Oh yeah, no I didn't, square root, yeah. So it turns out that this is a thing, and I learned this, I learned this from a tryst in mathematical finance, uh, but this, maximizing this sort of thing comes up in portfolio optimization. Maximizing a linear thing divided by the square root of a positive decimal quadratic form is the same thing as, uh, as um, maximizing the, 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 the function L of W plus delta, um, uh, plus delta LX of W minus, let's say, one half B of X. So now this thing is a is this thing is you can quite uh, uh, you can quite sort of easily sh show it, it, this is just a quadratic form, right? It's just it's a non it has an, it has a linear piece but basic so they don't call that a quadratic form what do they call it a quadratic function. I mean this is a generalized parabola, right? It's a linear thing minus a, a, a thing like this. So basically it looks like you know it's a it's it looks like this. It's a it's a big paraboloid, and you can you can solve it explicitly. And what I mean when I say that those two problems are equivalent, I mean the maximizer for this, like, will be, uh, the maximizer for this is gonna be a, a maximizer for this, but up to scaling. Because this thing is, only, this is both the numerator and denominator are homogeneous, so, so, uh, so, you know, the max is only defined up to scaling, but it just turns out if you find a maximizer for the second thing, then that will be a maximizer for this thing. And likewise, if you take a maximizer here, there's gonna be a unique rescaling, so that's the maximizer here. Okay, so then I'll say, so I, I let, let W star be the argmax over, um, over W in uh, Okay, so uh, I said so. So, like I, I said, that you can actually just fi fi calculate this explicitly. So I can say, okay, let's just let let the, the optimal thing be whatever this would be. But this is an argmax on the on the on the Rn plus one, right? Not on the cone. The thing is that this space, 
is the rest of the points in this R and N plus one aren't actually in this space. They don't actually correspond to filtrations. It's like, what happens if you have a weighted filtration, but then two weights cross each other? Then you'd have to like cook up some other filtration. You know, it's not, it's not actually in the space. The, the weights are allowed to come together, and that corresponds to deleting one step in the filtration, but they're not allowed to cross. They, no, it doesn't have meaning. So, so really, but you, you can still ask for where is the optimum for this problem on this Rn plus one. And what this is telling you is that if, so you have this, I have some cone, and if W star, uh, uh, it, so the delta here I'm saying, because I've, I've, I've called this thing here L delta. So if the, if the optimizer, if you, if you fix your filtration, and you look at this optimization problem, and the optimizer lies outside of the cone, that's just telling you that the constrained optimum is gonna lie on the boundary of the cone. So if I say, okay, the, the, the unconstrained optimizer is out here, well that means that the constrained optimizer is gonna be, this is the actual max. This is the max on the cone. Right, but if the maximum occurs on the boundary of the cone, I've already, the key, the observation here is that the boundary of this cone is just a union for other cones with deleted filtrations. So the, the key, the, the observation here is if W, if the optimizer, the, the unconstrained optimizer is, lies outside uh, of the cone, then you can just ignore I may as well just not consider this cone, because it's outside, I only have to consider filtrations where, the, where this unconstrained optimizer happens to lie on the cone to begin with. So actually what you can, what you can do, a little calculation that you do is in the case when delta is zero, in other words, when delta is zero, this is just the, this is just the bungee, this is just the usual uh, bungee thing. So in delta zero, you can compute this optimum, and you see that actually, it lies, the, the, the unconstrained optimum will lie in the cone if and only if the filtration is convex in the, in the usual, in the sense of hardenard simhan filtration. So, so this is a condition, this is a sort of optimization criterion which, which tells you, is this filtration convex? And then, and then as we know, so this, that's basically how this works. So if you restrict yourself to convex filtrations, so if I have an object and I'm considering all possible convex filtrations, that actually forms a bounded family. There's only boundedly many convex filtrations of a given vector bundle. That's like that, that's the key that makes this work. That's the key in the, in the, in the old way of thinking about it. In the, other, in, the, in the first way of thinking about it, that also is a key in, in uh, observation of this proof, and that's the key here. But this is how it's showing up. You say you only consider cones where the, that you only need to consider some of these cones, some kinds of, some shapes of filtrations. This lets you rule them out. And once you've ruled out all these other shapes, you end up with just a bounded family of filtrations that you have to test. And that's exactly the hardener simhan boundedness condition that I listed in the theorem. Okay, so that's how it works. But then, and then, so, so you might see where this is going. So, uh, yeah. So at delta equals zero, so W delta star is in cone, is in, uh, lies in the cone, uh, if and only if the cone is convex. So I want to say that basically this thing remains true as I start to move delta. That, that, that still many, many of these cones are, this thing lies outside the cone. So the idea is that, um, yeah, so for delta bigger than zero, I can both bound, oh, I should also say that actually this class, this quadratic form, which is sort of canonical and compatible under restriction and everything, the quadratic form gives you a metric. This, on this, this, this is not just RP plus one, it's an inner product space under the, under the inner product B. So you, you actually have a metric, and the idea is that you can bound the distance above so, you, uh, so I can say how far, how far does this move, and you can also bound the distance Low. So for every filtration, so, so I'm, I'm going to sort of, yeah, I'm going to spare you the, 
I'm going to spare you the, if you'd like to see the actual formulas, I can, I can give you the bounds and explain. But basically, you can say that as you, as you, if you move delta, there's in, in each of these, in each of these uh, vector spaces, you can bound above how far does this move. And then you can also bound below what is the disk, the closest point on the cone from this thing. And so, and in fact, what this tells you is that if these bounds, if this, it tells you that, that for many of these things, the, up, the upper bound for how far this can move is less than the lower bound for how far away this is. And so uh, still, as you even, for any finite motion of delta, most of these things will lie, uh, most of these W, w stars will still be outside the cone. <clears throat> so the upshot So the upshot is that W delta star lies in the cone uh, implies that when I take the, when I look at the ranks and degrees of the, of the associated gradient of this filtration, so this is, a, this is a sort of familiar diagram. If I have, so here's my, here's my E naught here, and then I have like an E1, E1, E2, E3. So you, you can look at the, you can plot the, the course of this filtration, and the, you can say that any, at any finite delta, it turns out that this being in this thing implies that there's some minimum slope, that, that, the, that this, this chain can never go below some slope. Um, So in other words, for any delta, you can find a slope, and you can say that the only way that the, that the W delta star is going to lie in this cone is if the whole chain here stays above that slope. And then that now is a bounded thing. If you, if you consider all filtrations that, that lie, that, that where every term in the filtration lies, you know, stays above this line of slope, that turns out that they're only now bounded, boundedly many filtrations. The family of such filtrations is bounded. Okay? So that's how you get the, bound, the hardness and unboundedness. And there's a similar thing here for semi-stability. This is this also tells you that the semi-stable locus is bounded too, because it's saying that sort of the, you know, yeah, I'm going to sort of hand wave a bit, but basically it's saying that the, that you know, if your delta semi-stable, there's sort of a bound to how unstable you were as just the underlying, how unstable the underlying bundle is. So if you look, consider the semi-stable locus as MCG bar at any delta that lies above only like finitely many of the usual hardenar Simon strata on bungee. You get boundedness and semi-stability by a similar analysis. Okay, well, are, are there any questions about this uh, this little argument? So, it could be in the interior. Yeah. It, yeah, well, it'll be all, it'll always be on the interior of some cone. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, but if it's on the, I'm just saying if it's on the boundary of one cone, then you just don't need to think about that cone because there's, you've already, you've already counted for it with some other filtration. So yeah, the, the, ultimately it'll be on the interior, I guess, of some cone unless it happens to lie on just like a ray. If it's like the, if the, um, yeah, um, yeah, so I guess, right, like, like maybe like a two-term filtration is, corresponds to a ray somehow. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Maybe a one-term filter. Anyway, yeah, yeah. It'll, yeah. It'll, it'll lie on the, unless it lies on an array, it'll be in the boundary of some cone. But this lets you, lets, lets you cut down the search, basically, to a just a bounded family. Um, okay, so that's how you get, that's how, the, that's how you prove the boundedness. And actually, I should, I should emphasize that I think, I'm not sure, but I think that, that, that the boundedness is the hard thing in all these, so the, so the, the hard part, quote unquote hard part, uh, where you actually have to do some analysis of the specific moduli problem is this. So the other things we need to show, so that, that's boundedness. And there are two kinds of boundedness, both HN and semi-stability. So we've, we've talked about that. So the other things we need to, need to show is we need to show the specialization property 
So we need to show HN specialization. And I'll remind you, we need to check HN specialization, and I need to, to, to check theta reductivity and S completeness. of the semi-stable locus. So, yeah, so I, I don't actually have a, I don't even have, I don't have, this tells me that they're harder, this tells me that HN filtrations exist, but it doesn't give me a stratification yet. For that, there was this other thing, which is specialization. And it turns out that these three things are sort of all linked, and I'll explain, or they can all be linked together, and that's, that's what I'm gonna say is the full, the full sort of, the final theorem of beyond geometric gradient theory is a, is a condition which gives you these three things for free, basically. So that's what I'm gonna describe now. So, so, so let's just say, where, where does this come from? So this has its origins, this condition has its origins in the geometric, in, in, in geometry. So basically, we have this new way of thinking. So, so the, the idea is that given the condition was uh, given a family X plus an HN filtration FK of the generic fiber, then, then M mu of the special fiber is uh, greater than or equal to the value of the numerical invariant on this filtration. And if equality holds, it should extend to a filtration of the family. So where does this come from in reductive GIT? So we have already, so let's say X is projective and G is reductive. <clears throat> I should actually just observe, so if you observe this condition, there is a condition that you can put on the stack which makes this hold automatically. Namely, if the stack is theta reductive, or we said theta reductivity says that if you have a family over a DVR and a filtration of the generic fiber, any filtration, you can extend to a, a filtration over the DVR. So in other words, if, if X were theta reductive and you have any family in a hardener Simhan filtration, you can extend that filtration, which says that the special fiber is at least that unstable. Right, because then, then that is some filtration who's, who makes this numerical invariant large, and maybe you can find a higher one, but at least it's that unstable. So theta reductivity with no other conditions on the numerical invariant would just automatically imply this condition. But that doesn't hold in this example. So, and it doesn't hold for, when X is projective mod reductive group, it doesn't hold. So where does this come from? So it's a similar kind of thing. So, I feel like I need more space. <clears throat> Okay, so in, so in other words, what does this data together give you? This is a family over a DVR and a filtration of the generic point. We already said that that's a map from A1R minus the origin to X mod G. So if X is, reject X is projective, G is reductive, and let's say L is linearly ample, uh, 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 is, is, is a G linear, ample bundle. And then the stack we're gonna consider here is the quotient stack X mod G. So this is, in particular, the, you know, this should work for, for normal GIT theory. So, uh, so what happens here? What really happens? So I have this map to BG, and this, this has, this is, pro, the, fibers of, the fiber of this map is X. So the fiber of this thing is projective. So basically what I want to say is that, so this is, a, this is my family over DVR and a filtration of the generic fiber, and I want to say that the special fiber is at, at least that unstable. So what I do is I, okay, so, so I've remarked that if, you, if this extends to A1R, uh, A1R mod GM, if you can literally, uh, if I could literally pull the, if I could literally pull the, the filtration over the whole family, then this condition holds automatically. So it would be great if I could extend that, but I can't in this case. But, I can extend it when I go to BG, it turns out. BG, if G is reductive, then BG is theta reductive. So there is a unique, this, this composition here, there, all, there does all, already exist a unique thing here. 
And so I, and it turns out, so I can't extend, I can't necessarily extend this map, but what I can do is I can resolve, this is a sort of a, this is like a birational map, so to speak, and I can resolve and I can find some, some sigma mod gm where this does extend. So this is my original f, this is my extension f tilde after blowing up a couple times at the or after blowing up a little bit the origin. And the reason is, I mean, I can think if I pull this back over A1R, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a X fiber bundle, this is a projective fiber bundle over A1R, and I have a section over, away from the origin, and so I can extend that after, after, after blowing up a little bit at the origin. So what does this look like? So, so, so sigma is a reduced um, uh, algebraic space, uh, but in fact, it's, in fact, in this case, it's a projective scheme. And it's a G, this is a GM equivariant map. And so what, is, what does sigma look like? So over, over most of the surface, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's an isomorphism, but then over the special fiber, it has, it has some, uh, we'll have a chain of P1s, basically, with the GM action. Let me just draw a clearer picture here. Over the special fiber, so if I take the special fiber, the, this closed point in A1R that I'm trying to send over, that sigma naught is really just a chain of, sp of spinning P1s. So it looks like this, looks like that. So there, there's a GM action. And there's going to be one, this is one A1 going off to infinity. Other than that, you get these P1s in the fiber. So let me label the, the points. I'll call this uh, X0, X1, and X2. So this is what this looks like. In the, this is, so everywhere it's an isomorphism, but I've, I've, added a couple chain, I've added a chain of P1s in the fiber over 0, 0. And the point is that if I pull back this line bundle L, So if I take if I take f tilde of L, L is my is my g ample line bundle. So I have this map, and I pull back f tilde of L. The way this is constructed, this is ample on these p ones. Yeah, and now I have to. Make sure I get it. Yeah, so, hold on. Oh yeah, I have it here. Okay. So that says that, that says that the, basically that mu, this numerical invariant, which is basically the weight of this line bundle, is gonna be the smallest, uh, So I have all these, I have these fixed GM fixed points in the fibers, and each one of these I can say, what is the Hilbert Mumford weight? And because it's ample on these P1s, it's gonna give me this inequality, this, this strict inequality like this. So my claim is that this implies, this will imply both the hardin arasimhan specialization condition and the theta reductivity of the semi-stable locus. Because, well, what does this say? So this is saying that, you know, let's say you have a family over the, a family over the EVR, uh, so you have a, a, and a filtration of the generic point. Well, what, what does this give you at the special point? So, so you know, if my, this, this point here is the special point. So this map here will be a filtration of the special point, and then a filtration of that guy, and then a filtration of that guy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and basically the, the, the claim is that uh, the, the, the weight of this filtration, wait, I get the, Sorry, look, I really thought I, you know. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So the weight of this filtration that you get at the special point here will be strictly larger than the weight of this filtration there. And the weight of this filtration is actually the weight of the filtration of the generic point. So the weight, so the, the filtration of the object you have at the generic point has the same weight as the, as the line bundle's weight here, and then this is bigger, bigger, and so that you actually end up with a filtration of the special point, size of little k, 
whose, whose numerical invariant is strictly bigger than the, than, the, than the one you started with. The exception to that, if those two things are equal, then these P1s can't exist. So, so because of this strict inequality, if, so, uh, so if, so this tells you that, that, that this, so let me call this F prime. So this mu of F prime is actually strictly better, bigger than, than, the, than the mu of F at the generic point, is greater than or equal to, and if equality holds, then this blow-up procedure is uh, contracted. All those P1s are, are contracted. Then sigma is actually equal to A1R, and I have my extension. So that's, that's, what, that's what's going on in, in reductive GIT. And that, the second thing, that's, that's the specialization property. And a similar thing can be used to show theta reductivity, basically. It's basically the same argument. If you, 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 have a, you can extend it to a chain like this, but if the, if the generic fiber was semi-stable, then uh, uh, if the generic fiber and the special fiber were semi-stable, then this would have to wait, have weight zero, and that would have to have weight zero. So again, the chain collapses, and you have a new theta reductivity. So I should say this also. And because I'm saying, I'll say, I'll say, and, and a similar argument for S completeness. So basically, in S completeness case, you're still just, it's the same thing. You have a surface, a punctured surface, and you sort of want to be able to extend. But you can extend. You can extend only, only after blowing up the surface a little bit. But then, it, then, you, then, you, then you argue that because of the, some strict monotonicity condition on the, on the weights in this fiber, that if both special points were semi-stable already, then actually that blow up had to be trivial. There's no blow up. So <clears throat> I guess this condition, you can call this condition You might call this condition theta monotonicity or S monotonicity, depending on whether you're, you're, you're working with A1R or whether you're working with this STR bar. So this condition, the existence of a sigma, A1R, um, uh, uh, with this property, For any family is is called is called uh, is called uh, theta monotonicity or strict. And I'll say similar. We have what are called S monotonicity. Right? That would that would be that says that if you if you have a um, if you have this sort of STR bar minus minus zero zero, and you have a family like this, then I can always find some 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 uh, reduced algebraic space like this, like by mapping birationally to STR. I should say. So this sits inside STR bar. And what it's saying is if you have a family on the punctured thing, then you can sort of find some birational model for STR such that this extends. So given an F, you can find an extension F, F tilde. So like this. And, then, and such that the, the numerical invariant is strictly monotone on the fibers over the special fiber. OK. So, so so this, these conditions, this, this theta monotonicity, 
and this sort of the strict theta monotonicity and the strict S monotonicity are going to apply for you that, first of all, it implies this hardener our simpson specialization property. It implies that the semi-stable locus is theta reductive. And if you have this S monotonicity, it implies that the semi-stable locus is, is, theta, is uh, S complete. So uh, let me just say in a, very briefly, and then I'll state the main theorem, and then I'll end. So I should say this, this argument works almost verbatim for in the case of Bun G and in the case of MCG. So what do I mean by that? I just take this picture. Now it's going to get a little bit crazy. So uh, I mean, in the sense that it, I, I'm going to now leave the world of finite dimensional things. And this is going to be a, basically an infinite dimensional version of reductive GIT. So basically, what I can say is I can put up here, um, here I can put this MCG of x. And remember that, that there's a proper MCG of x admits a proper map to bungee of x. And then this bungee of x admits a map uh, to what, I, what I'm going to call BG rat. And where G rat is the group of rational maps from the curve uh, 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 from, of, of sort of birational maps from C to G. So this is, in algebraic geometry, this is like a version of the gauge group. So explicitly, what is this? I have a G bundle on my curve, and I can just sort of restrict to the generic point. And that's a G bundle, that's a G bundle over the generic. You can think of this as parameters as just G bundles over the generic point. This is not an algebraic stack, it's some enormous thing. I can give you the precise definition. If you, if you care, I'll, I'll do it in a question. I'll, I'll answer a question if you want to see the precise definition. But this is something that's been studied by like Gates, Gorey, and, and Lurie in the context of like, you know, geometric Langland stuff and, and, and some and Gates, Gorey students. So there's, there's, so, and the point here is that, okay, so before we had the BG and a proper thing, a projective thing over it. Well, this is not, this map here is not representable. This is not like a scheme, but it's a, it's a, it, this is representable by rational Are what are called rational affine Grassmannians. For the group G, or in some sense, you can think of this as a, as a co-limit of Balance and Dribbenfeld Grassmannians. So, in some sense, this, the fibers of this map aren't really projective, but they're close enough to being projective that you can actually still guarantee this this extension. So, the way this works here is that basically, if you have a family over, if you, given a family over here, you can you can find some blow up. So, you can find some. A blow up of A1 mod GR such that the family extends and has this monotonicity property. Basically, by doing by thinking about the, uh, uh, an infinite dimensional version of uh, of of uh, the of usual reductive GIT. So let me just state the theor the final theorem here. I'm going to go over by a few seconds. I'm sorry about that. So a theorem is that um, if X is locally finite type. With affine diagonal, um, uh, then and mu is uh, uh, is uh, is strictly theta monotone. And s monotone. Then, um, uh, first of all, HN boundedness implies that mu defines a theta stratification. And, uh, and uh, oh, I guess there's only one statement here. That a, this hardened R Simhan boundedness implies that mu defines a theta stratification and x semi stable is theta reductive and s complete. So 
So in particular, in characteristic zero, if you, if you start with a numerical invariant that has these, these filling properties, these monotonicity properties, then all you have to do is check the HN boundedness, and you get, the, you get a theta stratification or a weak theta stratification. I'm saying in, in characteristic zero, it's the theta stratification, and you get that the semi-stable locus is theta reductive and S complete. So in particular, if the semi-stable locus is also bounded, it has a good moduli space. So I, I would say that that's sort of the main theorem of like the beyond G, GIT thing, the title of my talks. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you.